Good evening. We're glad you're with us tonight. I'd like to take a moment to encourage everyone tonight to check our Facebook page often and look for prayer requests. I know life is busy, and this is, but this is the main hub for keeping up with each other. Um, on that note, I'd like to say a special prayer uh, on Jack King's behalf tonight with his brother who is fatally ill with acute leukemia and is not expected to live much past the 1st of May. Also, there are notes on Preston's health and Preston's sister-in-law, Cindy, who is suffering greatly. So let's start off tonight with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Lord, we, uh, we just want to lift up uh, Jack King and Sylvia tonight as uh, Jack's brother has uh, gone into uh, hospice care. And we also want to say a prayer for, uh, for Ellen Laferney's sister, Cindy. Uh, she's not doing well. And, and we, just, we just want to lift these families up to you. And where appropriate, Lord, we ask for healing. And where appropriate, we ask for uh, the lack of pain. Just, just uh, help uh, Jack's brother go to the end of his life without suffering and without pain. Uh, we greatly love these people. We adore you, and we want to spend the next few minutes just talking about your word and just lifting you up and, and adoring you and trying to find ways to serve you and be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I want you to imagine a young, freshly dating or maybe freshly engaged couple. All right, so they're holding hands. They're constantly gazing into each other's eyes, and their attention is totally fixed on one another. So unless you hate love, it's hard not to feel um, at least a little bit happy for their newfound love. But we know that that phase doesn't last forever. So in that newfound love, people typically have eyes for only one another, and that is so fantastic. But with time, deepening relationships kind of evolve into another dimension. So we come to understand that mature intimacy doesn't just involve looking into each other's eyes, but also looking outward in the same direction, kind of having the same goals and pursuing those goals as a team. Okay, so the point here is this. We've been talking a lot about friendship with Jesus. So as our relationship with our friend Jesus grows, we gradually turn our eyes in the same direction that he's looking. So as you grow in your friendship relationship with Christ, we ought to develop a slight shift in focus. And that slight shift in focus is what we want to explore with you guys today. Yeah, so our first point here is, Looking outward together takes cooperating with God's dream. And when I say God's dream, I mean his desire for humanity, his optimal, uh, optimal existence for humanity. So we see this modeled uh, in uh, the life of Christ in three different ways. First, his words, his actions, and his response to suffering. First, through his words, he expresses his love and his desire, how he values us. In Luke 12, 6 and 7, Christ reminds us that sparrows, the cheapest of all sacrifices, are, are, are valued and not forgotten by God. And how much more valuable are we than a bunch of sparrows? Then he makes it intimate. He says, God knows you so well, he knows the hairs on your head. Now, that's an easier calculation on my head than your head, but Give me 10 still, years. yeah, 10 years. I, I'll remind you of that in 10 years. But still, it's a statement that God knows me, and not just the trivial things, but David says, he knows my inner thoughts. By his words, I can come to know his dreams and his desires for me, and I can start having that outward look uh, to run along with him. Second, Jesus modeled God's dreams for me by his actions. His behavior showed us that no matter our past, God values me for my potential, for my future in him. In John 8, Jesus is having this early morning Bible study, and a bunch of holier-than-thou religious leaders bring a, a woman caught in adultery to Jesus. They want to stone her just to prove a point and and trap Jesus. But Jesus will have none of it. 
So he shows grace and mercy are the first and foremost in the kingdom of God. Christ values reconciliation higher than the punishment for sins. His brother James says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Now third, and probably the most critical, is Jesus' sacrificial death. Jesus most visibly demonstrates God's dream for friendship and reconciliation by his sacrifice on the cross. John uh, John 15 and 13 has Christ saying, no one has a greater love than this than to lay down one's life for one's friend. Jesus sets the standards uh, for our love for each other by laying down his life for us and laying down our life for others and picking up the cross of Christ is for us. And I got to say that putting Keith's personal desires aside, putting my ego aside, putting my passions aside, putting my wants aside and doing what's best for my friends and for the kingdom of God is probably the biggest challenge in my life. I think we could all say that. But we also have, oh, this is the second point. We also have to begin participating in God's dream once Mm -hmm. we've identified it with our closest neighbors. So Jesus, uh, a whole lot of the time, expresses God's dream by just making friends with the people around them, whoever they are. Uh, Even when Judas betrays him in Matthew 26, 50, Jesus calls him friend. So God desires communities of nuclear and spiritual family just living in harmony with people next door or your immediate family or with co-workers or anyone you're going to run into daily, which hopefully isn't too many people during this little season of life. Um, But each day it behooves us to look outward toward our closest neighbors and ask God to help us to become at least a little bit less self-centered and a little bit more others-centered. Amen. I should also say this, we have to try to to befriend people without the ulterior motive of changing them. Because how would you feel if you knew someone only wanted to be your friend in order to change you? And so as we enter into these friendships with the people around us, we need to remind ourselves that the Holy Spirit does the changing and not us. So a good example of this in my life is my grandma. So she passed away in 2016 and left a beautiful legacy of befriending and loving everyone who she came across. So my grandma provided uh, an accepting and loving environment for all of us. And so that was for her kids, for her grandkids and great grandkids. So many times growing up, I thought of myself as like a black sheep, uh, well, the black sheep of my family because I was just so different from everyone else for, in, for no other reason aside from that. But my grandma was my absolute biggest fan in literal, literally everything I did. Like she could see that sometimes I felt like an outsider and she always reached out to me with encouragement and love. And she treated all of us like that. It wasn't just me. It was every single child, grandchild, and great-grandchild. That's what she did for us. And rest assured, there were many of her grandkids, including me, definitely including me, who were almost constantly doing things that she disagreed with. I mean, to describe her, I would describe her as a powerful matriarch uh, who loved God with all of her heart, soul, mind, and strength and loved her neighbor as herself. I mean, there were even a few of us grandkids who turned away from the faith entirely, and that didn't even come close to stopping the freight train that was grandma's love for us, rooted in Christ. When we would rebel against her or God, we weren't met with her wrath. We were met with amazing food and hugs and warm conversations. I had a doctor's appointment a few months after she passed away. And my doctor, uh, who had also been her physician, he like put his hand on my shoulder and he said, your grandma was a special and wonderful woman and it it was an absolute joy knowing her while I got to. And I would be willing to say that that doesn't happen too often. But her legacy was that of finding the people closest to her in her sphere of influence and loving them the way that Jesus loved them without an agenda, with the complete and total intention of just simply being Jesus to people and letting the Holy Spirit do his work. Awesome. That brings us to our third point tonight. To look outwardly together with Christ, we will begin to identify the brokenness around us, in us, and begin 
to serve our community. Obviously, we cannot befriend all those living in need and misery around us, but we can have influence on everyone in our personal community. Uh, We're all capable of connecting to those around us who are experiencing pain. I think I become frozen and paralyzed and uh, by overwhelmed with the thought of all the brokenness around me, the, all that I see on the news every day and everything that I hear. But when Christians can identify their times of brokenness and suffering, they are then perfectly aligned to participate in being Christ to others who are in close proximity. Like I have a friend who was, well, a, a little arrogant, a little bit of an elitist, but then his daughter who was born, was born with a severe physical and mental disorder that drastically impacted her ability to learn and function. Now he's become, uh, now he's stepped into her suffering and he's become a huge advocate for parents with disabilities. He's developed a love for people like his daughter who are totally transparent and honest. And that's not something that he had before until he stepped into her brokenness and learned to appreciate other people. I have a close friend who admits to me that he lacked empathy for others growing up. It was just void in his character. And then he had a very painful condition that dramatically affected his quality of life. And through suffering, he learned to empathize with others who were in pain and how to become an encourager to people like that. One of my greatest examples of this is one of my spiritual heroes. Her husband cheated on her and then ran off with another woman. Later, he returned back. Years later, he returned back with a a fatal illness for several years. She nursed him and provided for him until his death. Before this experience, she was almost uh, a reclusive person. But after she started, uh, after this experience with nursing her husband uh, until his very death, uh, she came out and started speaking truth into other people's lives, uh, talking about forgiveness, talking about patience, and how to have successful marriages all because she came alongside Christ's suffering so that she might have an outward vision with Christ, enduring suffering so she might live out Christ's dream for us. And so one, if you want to go a little bit more in depth in the talk that we're giving tonight, I would encourage you to read the book Beyond Loneliness by Trevor Hudson. Uh, It's fantastic. Uh, But all of that, is to say, as we develop in our friendship with Christ, we begin to look outward together. And that takes a few things. So that that takes cooperating with God's dream, as Keith described. And that begins uh, by participating in God's dream with our closest neighbors. And that also takes identifying the brokenness around us and serving the broken people in our community. Right. And so as always, we pray that you might know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Good night. Stay safe.